Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them, I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. I have been a subscriber to the New York Times Book Review for many years. And those of you familiar with it know that in recent years up front, they've got a feature called Buy the Book, which is basically a QA and a with an author or celebrity. And years ago, one of the celebrities they had on the Buy the Book page was Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes and CBS News. And they had asked her what she's reading these days. And she said, I'm reading these hysterically funny books um, written by this guy named David Rosenfeld. And um, they have, you know, dogs, uh, the titles play off of dogs. Apparently he's a dog lover. Well, since then, I I love comedic novels, Carl Hyacin and uh, Tom Wolfe and uh, Kurt Vonnegut, Douglas Adams and so on. I went out there and I bought, um, well, so far I've read four David Roosevelt books. One is Best in Snow, Bark of Night is another Dog Tags is another, and then Open and Shut. And I wouldn't say they're dog-based novels, but dogs come into play. And um, if you if you are a person who doesn't care for pets or d- does not care for dogs, it wouldn't stand, stand in your way at all in reading David Rosenfeld's books. Also, I get the audio edition, and Grover Gardner, one of the great readers out there, does the audio. He, he's the guy who reads the audio editions uh, of David Rosenfeld's books, at least the ones that I've listened to. And um, he's he's about as good as it gets when it comes to 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 reading. Now, um, David Rosenfeld is known for, um, yeah, putting putting some dogs in in the novels and, and playing up dogs in the title. But he he's owned as many as I think it's forty two dogs today. He owns in the mid twenties in terms of dogs. We'll be talking about that a little bit, and uh, obviously about his writing and. Um, his uh, his background in the movie business, which is very interesting, moving movie uh, moving from the movie business to the uh, book writing business and so on, and obviously David Rosenfeld is a guy in the spotlight today. David, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, how many dogs do you have right now? Oh, we're we're at a historic low. We have twelve. Oh, really? Twelve? Okay, you are at a historic low. Okay, yes. but you've had as many as forty two or forty five. Uh, 42, but we think anything over 40 is slightly eccentric. Yes. We we live in New England now in Maine, and the rescue situation is terrific. So they really don't need us like they did in California. So we uh, only take in dogs that are old or ill or epileptic or whatever. Or blind. can't, Can't otherwise be placed. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're doing God's work there, um, taking in these dogs. Now, by way of background, you met your wife. She had a golden retriever named Tara or Tara, the right. greatest dog in the world, according to you. According, is to, that any, what set you according off to any independent party would say the same thing. Trust me. <laughs> I, I bet. I bet. So is that what got you off and running? I mean, were you already a dog lover? I, I know your wife, I think, is magnitudes beyond you in terms of loving dogs. But were you already a dog lover? I was a dog liker. Like and it. Tara, when I met my wife and Tara, she was about six months later, she got cancer, uh, nasal carcinoma, and it took like three months for her to pass away. And it was like a transforming experience for us. And we started um, after she died. My wife wasn't ready to get another dog. So uh, we started volunteering at a shelter in LA. And it was it's they're horrible, just absolutely horrible. And it became too passive for us to watch dogs being put down or given out as guard dogs. So we started a foundation ourselves, a rescue foundation, and we rescued about 4,000 dogs. Um, But whenever a dog was 
too ill or old or whatever to get them to get anybody to want them we brought them home as our pet because we weren't going to leave them in a cage so that's how it started so that's how the number built up when you have 25 dogs and they tell you they're going to put down a golden retriever at three o'clock you get number 26. so that that's how it all started now you um the foundation you refer to is called the Terra Foundation. Is that right? Named after yeah, clever, the dog. That you title, like huh? Say it very, again. Very clever name, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it's it's suitable. It is suitable. Yeah. So that that uh, you know what is that? TerraFoundation.org? No, it doesn't exist anymore. It's um, ah, when we okay. moved to Maine. Like I say, there's just no need for us to to rescue and place dogs. So they know us, and if they have dogs they can't place, the shelters they call us and we take them in. Now, um, as I was saying at the top, you your titles play off of dogs. There are dogs in your books. It's not over the top by any means, as I was saying. A person doesn't even have to like, like dogs to like your novels. Uh, but was there any calculus involved in in dogs? Because there are, I mean, you know, they they always say if you want to grab people's attention, put a dog or a cat in the photo or what have you. Did was was that part of your calculation in in uh, um, writing with dog esque titles and dogs as characters? Yes, but it was belated. What happened was, I wrote five Andy Carpenter books, um, where he, you know, Andy, the main character, had a rescue foundation. He liked dogs, and he had a golden retriever. But dogs had nothing to do with the plot at all. And then the sixth book, which was going to be the last one was called play dead and a dog was actually integral to the plot uh so the author put uh, the publisher put a golden retriever on the cover and of course it sold twice as many books as any previous one wow so, so they asked me to write another one which i did and and you know dogs are just there, there's a large dog community out there so now all the do all the books in that series have a dog connection in that something about a dog like triggers the mystery, uh, some version of that. But after that, like you say, the dogs are not really important to it. Um, they just, you know, they're there and and they justify putting a dog on the cover, which is really the goal. Now, in terms of your writing itself, I mean, your background, uh, you, you, you were in the movie business, you kind of evolved, and we'll get into that in a minute. But in terms of, of writing, these are um, they're court very, very much courtroom based, and uh, uh, kind of a combination between legal and detective novels. Would you say? I would. I mean, they're definitely the Andy Carpenter books are definitely legal in that they have um, you know there's a trial. Andy's def a defense attorney representing a client who's usually wrongly accused and there's a trial. Um, but there is a detective element in that they not only try to defend him, but they try to find the actual killer. So yes, it's, it's, it's a procedural in that sense, but it culminates in a trial. You know, and these books are very funny. And I mean, early in the book is where you really uh, get that payload. And then, and then the, the book, kind of settles into the 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 narrative the plot not that it isn't funny the rest of the way but early on i i tend to find that there there's really co very comedic writing do you make an effort for the uh, to to be comedic or is that something that just has come naturally to you and you just wrote wrote what you felt and people found it to be comedic um i actually sometimes make an effort not to be um although it's my favorite kind of writing um when i I had written some standalones a while back and the first standalone I vowed would, there would be no humor in it at all to make it different from the Andy Carpenter books. And when I finished it, the editor got back to me and said, she really likes it. It's hysterical. So <laughs> it's like, I, I sort of do it without trying to. And, and especially in the Andy Carpenter books, you're in his head. He's speaking first person, present tense. So it's like being in my head, which is no place I recommend, but it's um, <laughs> it's got that warped view of the world and it comes out as humor. Definitely. You're definitely right that in the early part of the books, there's more of it. Um, 
And so were you a class clown back in high school? I mean, were you considered a class clown? Does it do, 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 do the irreverent and, and, and funny comments just come naturally to you? I guess so. I mean, I, I wouldn't say class clown was the right way to put it, but um, I, yeah, I definitely think that I relied on humor. I was, I got out of, um, I was really young as I went through school. I was younger than all of my classmates and um, by a lot. And I think I used humor to, you know, I'm psycho babble now, but and I have never thought about this, but I probably used humor to, you know, get accepted socially. So Andy Carpenter is the, is your character. He's a lawyer. He's out there solving cases and he's got uh, how many, how many Andy Carpenter books have you written now? What, do you, what, what number are you up to? I honestly don't know. I, I think, I think the other day I checked, so I could probably back into this by read. There's probably around 30, 28, 30. I'm, I'm not sure. Wow. And you're and I've written two that haven't come out yet that are coming out this year. So how long does it take you to write one? I hope my editor is not listening to this, but I um uh may you know at, at the outside five weeks, I'd say. Wow. So you're a fast writer. You are a fast writer. Yeah, I, I and when the deadline is due, I'll I'll probably write the last two thirds of the book in two weeks. Um what happens is what happened for me is I was never, I wasn't a writer my, most of my adult life. So I never learned the process. I never took courses or read books. So I sort of like never learned to be painstaking about it. And my writing would probably be better if I was, but I, it's just instinctive to me. So I just sit down and do it. I, there's no such thing as writer's block. I just churn it out. What is your regimen? Uh, do you get up in the morning to do this? Do the dogs sit in your lap or uh, nip at your ankles while you're working? Yeah, most days I don't work. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I really start to work every day when a deadline is approaching. But um, when I do, you know, my regimen when I work and not work is pretty much the same. I sit in a recliner in my office with the computer in my lap and I have the television on. Um, so and the dogs are all around me. Um, and I'm interrupted by, you know, feeding twice a day and going to the vet almost every day and, um, <laughs> things like that. So yes, the dog's interrupted to that degree, but there's not, not terribly. Well, you're a lucky guy that this stuff comes so easily to you. It comes pretty naturally to you. It sounds like most people really struggle to produce copy and, uh, and to complete a book and, um, and you're doing it in, in, in short order there. So the non-Andy Carpenter books that you've written are, how would you characterize those? Well, the first, let me just think now, I've written probably 11 non, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, probably 15 non-Andys. Um, and I, what, I, what started out as I was writing standalones, and they were meant to be, like I said before, like thrillers. And I wrote seven of those. And the last one, I turned into like a short series. So I, of the la of the seventh standalone, I wrote three of those with the same characters. And then I've written four books now with a spinoff of an Andy of the Andy books called the K Team. And then I wrote two nonfiction books about our life and rescue. One was called Dog Tripping, and the other was called Lessons from Tara. Gotcha. So um, let's go back in time a little bit to NYU. That's where you graduated from. By the way, just for our listeners and, and for you, I'm from upstate New York. And when I was in high school, we called the person who was the funniest in the class, the class clown. It sounds actually like a pejorative phrase, but uh, we didn't think that way. Okay. Well, I just want to be clear also with our listeners that it wasn't uh, uh, meant to be pejorative at all. Um so you, you go to NYU. Did you study? The, you decided to go into the movie business um, after graduating, but were you studying cinema at NYU? No, my my college experience was sort of a fiasco. I, I got a full scholarship to NYU. And it was given I was I lived in Patterson, New Jersey, and it was given by a Patterson Alumni Association. So I got a full scholarship and I went to the NYU campus, which the campus I was at was um, a very nice campus up in the Bronx, actually. It's called University Heights. 
And I never did any research. And when I, I just, you know, I got a scholarship. So, of course, I took it. When I got there, anything that I wanted to take wasn't there. I was interested in journalism or cinema or advertising or I can't remember what else. The writing was not one of them. Um, and they didn't have any of it. All they had was liberal arts, engineering, and, you know, pre-med. So I tried to transfer down to the Washington Square Village campus where they had everything and, and the scholarship didn't transfer. Mm. So I wound up being a history major. Now, um, you know, you said earlier that you were a lot younger than your classmates. Were you a prodigy growing up? What, were you were uh, ad really advanced in terms of your studies? I just skipped a bunch of times, which um, which was not that hard in Patterson. But I so I skipped a bunch of times. So I was much younger than most. So Patterson, New Jersey, you said that you grew up in a middle class uh, family, loving parents. You have three brothers. You're the middle of three brothers. Right. And um, and you played sports. Okay, so you go to NYU. They wouldn't uh, they wouldn't transfer the scholarship, um, but you come out of NYU with a degree, and um, you decide to go into the movie business. How did that actually happen? Were you a movie lover, and you just decided I want to go make movies? No, it's <laughs> it's less uh, uh, worthy than that. My my uncle was the president of United Artists. So, and he lived in California. So he invited me out to California for the summer after my junior year. And I worked at United Artists for the summer. And my job was um, taking people onto the set of movies. So it was a real, and I, I lived in his fancy house in Beverly Hills and I drove his Jaguar. It was a very nice summer. So um, that was when I decided I wanted to be in the movie business and having an uncle that was president of United Artists made it rather simple to get in. So that's why I did it. So the, my entire senior year, I already knew I wanted to be in movies. And then, then you climbed the ladder at United Artists and you went all the way up to um, what, what title were you at? Well, not really. What happened was I, I left United Artists after a couple of years and I went to an ad agency and then I came back to United Artists as a, I think, a senior vice president. And I think I made it to executive vice president. And then I went to a company that had just started called TriStar Pictures. And, and I eventually became president of TriStar Pictures marketing when I left. And then I left the movie business after that. Okay. So you, um, I see it in my notes here now. Um, so you say I failed miserably at it. Is that is that really true? Uh, it really <laughs> is, actually. Uh, I mean, if you if you're judging my success in movie marketing by the success of the movies, then I failed miserably. I mean, we had, you know, I worked on Rocky and Rambo, and you know, so some films that were very successful, but overall, we we did not do well during my tenure. Now, if I, you know, if I dropped a self deprecation for a moment, I would say that many of the movies could not have succeeded with anyone marketing them. I mean, they were real turkeys. But if you, if you measure my success by box office performance, I was unsuccessful. So uh, what what was the result of that? Did Were you asked to um, relinquish the position? Did you just decide, I'm not good at this? I want to I wanna do no, something it, else? How'd it happen? It was actually amazing. You would think I would have been asked to relinquish the position but uh, we were, TriStar was a New York company. The entire time I was in the movie business, I was in New York, although I went to California very frequently. Um, so what happened was Sony bought us. We were a sister company of Columbia and Sony bought us and was moving us to California. And I didn't want to move. My kids were in high school. You know, I just didn't want to go. So I quit and became, and I, a friend of mine who was a director, um, helped me along. I started writing a screenplay and I would send these pages to a friend of mine who was a pretty big time director and producer. And he like coaxed me through it. And the first script I wrote sold. So all of a sudden I was a screenwriter. It just sort of happened. Now, I believe you said, now that was for television. Is that right? No, that was for, that was a movie. That um, was it sold about 10 movie scripts, features. None of which got made. 
And it pays pretty good just to get them optioned, right? I mean, I, I had a friend who was a, 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 a film writer. He had a couple made, but he was frustrated that he had several of them purchased or optioned. And he made quite a bit of money doing that. So you still were pulling in some some dough doing that, correct? That was fine, but it's not, you know, you don't get big money unless you get them made. And, yeah. and you get some, when you get some acceptance as a writer, then they, you get rewrites, which are, you know, you work for three weeks and make a lot of money. So there's ways to do it. I was in, uh, I was a B-list writer. I mean, I, you know, I, I was sold scripts to most of the studios, but you know, when they had a problem or when they had a real hot project, it wasn't, let's get David Rosenfeld on the phone. That's for sure. <laughs> Give me Rosenfeld. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, um, what then, I mean, you could have continued to do that, but, but your next, uh, the next phase of your career was moving into television or not? Yeah. I, I uh, started writing the same friend actually was a big time TV producer and director. And I, um, I started writing TV movie scripts, which for me was the perfect environment because you have to have absolutely no artistic integrity whatsoever. <laughs> you just write whatever they want and cash the check. So I probably sold 10 of those, maybe less, maybe eight, and three of them got made. Um, Were these Lifetime style movies or or what? Uh, one of them was literally Lifetime, but the first one was ABC and it was a woman in Jeopardy movie with starring a woman named Vanessa Marcel, who had been a soap, a soap star. And the second one was, it was called Deadlocked. And it went on, wound up on TNT and it was David Caruso and Charles Dutton. Uh -huh. And the third one was an awful movie that wound up on Lifetime. It was called uh, Deadly Isolation. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those Lifetime movies are, are um, uh, they're entertaining. I mean, I if nothing else is on, I switch them on. I, I kind of astound my wife when I do that, but it's kind of like, you know, let's see what happens with this. It's always some guy trying to uh, either dupe or murder a woman, right. and it's uh, pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Um, now, your decision to move out of television then was prompted by what? I, I know you're saying that there's no artistic integrity. Did you just kind of, did that all just wear thin on you? No, what happened was I actually, I was on a plane, I think. And I was watching, uh, what do you call it? For a few good men, uh, a few good men for like the 10th time. And I decided I wanted to write a courtroom drama. And it was, uh, they weren't making them in, tele in television movies then and still aren't. So I started writing it as a novel and I wrote, I wrote like 50 pages and gave it to my wife to read. And it was sort of like on a whim and she liked it, the pages. And, and so I finished it and I gave it to my film agent and he sent it to a book agent and she sent it to Warner books, one publisher, and they bought it with sequels. So all of a sudden I was a novelist. Right. That's an amazing story that, that it happened so fast for you. The that you did the 50, coming. your wife encouraged you, then the agents and editors are bouncing it around and boom, you got a deal. From the time I started writing it to the time they bought it, it took maybe seven weeks. I don't even know if it was that much. Um, so, but I, you know, I had no, I, I still don't, but I had no idea what I was doing. And in fact, I didn't even realize I had written a mystery. I thought it was, I, I didn't realize there was, there was no drama uh, um, genre called legal, right? So I realized it was a mystery when Warner Books gave it to their imprint called Mysterious Press to, to release. And then I had no idea it was a series until they suggested, you know, they wanted to buy it with sequels. I, they wouldn't buy it unless I promised sequels. So that's how it became a series. But I, I really never thought that far ahead. I, I never thought this would go anywhere. How many sequels did they want? Was this a three book deal or were they asking for five or six? I think it was four, but I'm not, I mean, total of four, but I honestly don't remember. So um, <clears throat> you're not the kind of guy who grew up as a kid thinking, I want to be a writer. Like early in life, you knew this. Um, that wasn't the case. And yet you end up obviously in the arts and 
then you decide I want to write a courtroom thriller and it just is happening for you. I mean, you obviously have a natural aptitude for the writing and the comedy, and yet it wasn't something that you were pining to do from the time you were a child. Uh, you, you, you kind of, it almost sounds like you fell into it and now, uh, you know, you're in the channel now. It's just everything is zooming ahead. I totally fell into it. It was, I, I mean, I wish I'd fallen into it earlier. It's so, it's a lot, it's a great lifestyle. Uh, but no, I, it was completely accidental. And Did you never, know you were a good writer though? I mean, had you written other things, anything from like letters and memos and reports prior that then you knew you were a good writer, even if you didn't know that you'd be a good fiction writer? I did not know I was a good writer. I, I, I would write when I was in marketing, of course, we, you know, it was advertising copy. And sometimes I wrote that, but no, it never entered my mind that I, I'd write a book. Interesting. I so all that it did. Now, now my, uh, I, I did some background research on you and when you were in the movie business, you said the most focused actor you ever worked with was who? You're asking was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Tell me a little bit about. Is that him. what your I mean, research showed? I'm, I'm sorry. What did you say? Is that, you? You, is that what your research showed? That that's what I said? Yes, that you had oh. said Arnold Schwarzenegger. But tell me and tell the listeners, what is it about his work style that made him so focused? I mean, how did how did this present itself well first of all he was he was relentless in terms of the amount of work he would do i mean you know when you're in marketing you ask people to do special things like special tv spots and special photo sessions and he was always there never hesitated would, would the hardest work i've ever seen well that may be a stretch but very hard worker um but he also knew a lot like he, he he educated himself and so let's say let's put it this way uh, stars judged are judged and judge themselves by how much their movies make okay so therefore they want studios to spend more money on marketing and advertising and tv and so on because with a theory that'll increase the gross even though that may not be an efficient way for a studio to spend money, you know, studios don't want to overspend on those things, but actors are always, and directors and producers are always pressing the studio to spend more. Schwarzenegger would do the same, but he would come with knowledge. So he knew what a TV rating point is, what reach and frequency is, he, you know, he knew the business and that was very rare. I mean, usually it was just spend more money and in his case, it was spend more money and here's how you should spend it. And here's why. And so on, which was really impressive. So he uh, actually was helping with the targeting of the of the, of the uh, um, marketing. Yeah. And candidly, we didn't need his help. His goal was to get us to spend more. We knew who our target was for an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Right. It's not <laughs> yeah. Women over 70. Right. Um, <laughs> but he um, and he just. I, I always tell this story and I'll tell it quickly now, but we, we had, he had a movie called red heat for us. And he was, um, he played a Russian cop who comes to Chicago and uh, going after a criminal. He meets up with Jim Belushi and they fight crime. That's the, that's the rough story. So he, we're at, we're at a meeting one night and the next day he's going on good morning America to talk about the movie. And we had had Rambo three weeks earlier. And he always had a big rivalry, rivalry with Stallone, but he was going on about how he saw Stallone on Good Morning America for Rambo three weeks earlier, and then how Stallone, they, they asked a question which got Stallone off on a tangent, and he didn't talk about only about Rambo, he talked about something else unrelated, and Stallone was, thought that was horrible, like if you, you know, you're there to sell the movie. So he said, there's nothing they could ask him that he wouldn't talk about red heat. So I, I, he said, try me. So I said, Arnold, how much did you weigh when you were born? So I'm paraphrasing now, but what he said was that I'm glad you asked that. He said, because I was very small, I was only seven and a half pounds. And when my mother came to the red, the set of red heat, she said, Arnold, look at you. You were such a little baby. 
And now you play this big Russian cop who comes to Chicago to fight crime, right? He, he turned that question into a sales pitch on Red Heat. And that's what he was like. He was absolutely amazingly focused. I saw Red Heat. I enjoyed that movie. Uh, I remember that, you know, Jim Belushi would ask him, where did, where did you learn to do that? And he kept saying Kiev. Because, yeah, you know, the, but the, the movie did, was one of my biggest failures. <laughs> it was, I, I was entertained by it, telling you the truth. But well, I'm talking um, about the success. We had two more. We had two Schwarzenegger movies. They both died. One was called A Running Man and the other was Red Heat. But the other thing about Schwarzenegger, which was interesting and, and Red Heat was an example of it, is when you're a star, you can dictate things like I only want my picture on the poster I only want my name to be above title, you know, not share the spotlight with other people. And we we tried to broaden the appeal of a, of a Schwarzenegger film from just action to also comedy. It was before uh, Twins came out. So we asked him if Jimmy Belushi could be on the poster with him, you know, equal and side side by side. And he said yes, without hesitating. And he did that because he wanted, you know, he thought it might be good for the movie. Interesting. So, um, and he was after specifically in Red Heat, he was after somebody, some guy, a criminal from Russia. I remember he, yeah, yeah. His name, Boris or Vladimir or somebody like that. He was after. Right. right. Um, so the, you say that he wanted to be, you know, in the poster, insisted on being in the poster. Um, you and your, uh, Publishing company no, probably no, insists that sorry. a dog. He, he allowed Belushi to be in the poster. He did in that case, yeah. yeah. In that yeah. case, he did. But he right. he wanted to be, you know, out front on these things. Um, your your formula for success has been, well, besides, you know, your writing ability has been putting um a dog on the cover. Do do you insist that a dog be on the cover or your publisher exist insists that the dog a, a dog be on the cover because the numbers, the numbers bear it out. Absolutely. And and it's not, I mean, I, I certainly want dogs on a cover, but the public, if I, if I rewrote the Manhattan te telephone directory, the publisher would put a dog on a cover. <laughs> um, so you have, um, you have a consistent voice, you know, sometimes I talk to authors about, you know, describe your voice and, and they don't necessarily feel like they have a voice because it's like, well, I'm a different character over here than I am over there, but you play Andy Carpenter. You are Andy Carpenter, and um, there's a consistency to the voice, which you would expect because you don't want the person's, you know, you don't want them to act as though they're bipolar and you don't really know what kind of personality is going to show up on the page when you get the next novel. Um, but what about, how would you describe uh, your voice, Andy Carpenter's voice? Um, well, first, first, let me, before I even answer that, let me just say, at one point I wrote, I think it was called Unleashed. It was an Andy Carpenter book. And then I back to back, like the next day, I started a book called Dog Tripping. And Dog Tripping is a nonfiction book in my voice about our trip. We went we moved from California to New York uh, to Maine with 25 dogs on three RVs. And it's the story of that move and of our time in rescue. So I literally went from writing in Andy's voice to writing in my voice. And it turned out to be the same voice. <laughs> I was really, I was actually surprised how identical the voices are. So having which, said which that, is, maybe what, helps explain why the writing's so natural to you that you're you're being yourself. It's just me talking. It's like um, it feels like I'm cheating. It's so so simple, um, other than the plot stuff. But um, yeah, I, I guess you know Andy is one of the reasons I made Andy a lawyer is because. You can be sarcastic and badgering and obnoxious and get away with it, right? You're supposed to in cross-examination. So that would probably describe my voice. I mean, sarcastic, very dry, um, you know, a observational humor about things around him, um, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's and he's I think he's pretty clear in what he says. There's very little description in my books. It almost never rains even. I mean, it's like uh, I'm not visual at all. And and Andy doesn't describe the books, in a, describe his surroundings in a visual way ever, almost ever. Right, right. 
Yeah, it's not landscapes or the exactly. architecture or uh, right. you know the the weather, as you were saying. It really is all about people interacting, which is you know that's really the core of it. I mean, that's part of what I like about it. Uh, so many times, authors will, you know, they describe in in it's it's um, gratuitous. A lot of it's just gratuitous description that really isn't uh, necessary. That works for some readers, I suppose. Not not so much for me. Uh, now you do say that you don't really do any research for your books. You're writing off the cuff. I mean, you you know law, and you know the courtroom, but you don't really do do any research. You you have said, and you find googling exhausting. I believe uh, That's exactly right. Said. Right. Yeah, I just uh, I just don't. I mean, I, I, it's I just sit down and write. And in terms of the legal stuff, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm sort of winging it. Um, I have a couple of friends, one a lawyer and one a judge, who I will bounce things off of occasionally if I think something's not going to pass the smell test. Um, but I'm basically just winging it legally. Do you have any one book? I know this this is kind of a dangerous question to ask because it, it never seems to yield a real answer. Um, and especially when you've got 30 different Andy Carpenter books out there, but is there one that, that is stand out for you or one that you felt especially uh, in, in the groove on? An Andy Carpenter book or any book? Uh, why don't you, uh, let's say any book. Any book. I, my favorite book that I've written uh, is the le- by far the least successful of them. Um, and that's a, my two favorite books are Dog Tripping. And, and and then my real favorite is a book called Lessons from Tara. And it's a both nonfiction, right? Nonfiction in my voice. And they're both the story of our time and rescue. Uh, Dog Tripping is mostly about the trip, the crazy trip east. And Lessons from Tara is more about our life and rescue and about individual dogs and what it's like living with 35 dogs. Um, so I, I love those books. Um, the Andy Carpenter book, they're pretty indistinguishable for me, but maybe either the first book, which was called Open and Shut, or maybe the fourth book, which was called Sudden Death. Mm. I'll only mm-hmm. say that because it, it's about football, and there's also a um, more of an emotional element to it. His, his girlfriend leaves him though she comes back in later books. Are there any um, any things that you avoid um, that you stay away from in your writing? Now, you mentioned description, but I think that probably is natural to you just to, that you don't you don't have an interest in describing things. But are there certain things that you just try to stay away from or that you try to integrate, make sure that you integrate into the books? I certainly stay away from any dog getting hurt or killed. That's for sure. Mm hmm. I mean, people tell me that they go into a bookstore and they pick up the, a book and they skim through to the end to to make sure that they st- see, that they still see Tara's name near the end of the book, so they'll know she didn't die. Um, so I stay away from that. Um, I don't put any politics in the books. Um, and in terms of integrating things, I mean, you know, it's it's a for- they're formula books. You know, I mean, as try as I might, I, I they all seem to follow the same formula. Um, so I don't think there's anything special I try to add. I do like to have, you know, when I'm done with a book, I skim through it to make sure I think it's funny. Um, but nothing else that I could think of. What do you see as your obligations to the reader? Obviously not, no, no injury, no 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 killing or maiming of dogs because that, that would offend the reader or, or hurt the reader's sensibilities. But just when you're when you write a book, um, what do you think that expectation is of the reader or what your obligation to that reader? I, I, just to provide entertainment. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't delude myself into thinking it's great literature. I mean, I, you know, I don't expect anybody to read one of these books and say, hey, wait a minute. I thought Hemingway was dead. You know, I, <laughs> but, I, you know, I want it to be entertaining. They're, they're you know, I, usually when I finish, I hate the book. I hate writing. I hate everything about it. Um, and that a few months later, I'll get the, um, you know, I'll get the galleys to proofread. And not only have I forgotten the book, but as I read it, I'm like, 
surprised by what I see and I laugh at the jokes and um and I generally like it I'm usually I can't think of too many cases where I haven't liked the book after a few months and thought it was you know that it didn't meet my criteria for being entertaining which is really all I care about right right so um what do you read what do you like to read in terms of fiction well it's hard for me because um I can't read while I'm writing right so because I wind up imitating the other author which generally would be a good thing I guess but um so the only fiction I read I shouldn't say the only but the the fiction the two writers I'll stop writing to read when a book comes out are Lee Child and Michael Connelly Um, Mm -hmm. but I you know I like reading nonfiction much more and what what uh, when it comes to nonfiction, is there a particular few subjects that you like a lot? I know you were a history major, so I don't know if history is part of that. No, it's not. Um, you know, more, I wouldn't say current events, but like, like I finished a book recently called Red Notice by Bill Brower, uh, which is about his tangling with the Russians and his... Uh, and them, them being after him and he him getting this thing passed in Congress called Magnitsky, which is it oh, was yeah. player. It's really it's fascinating. So I like yeah. relatively current stuff, 20th century. I'm reading a book now about um the Klan in in Indiana in, in the mid-20s, which is fascinating. Um you know, the author of Red Notice, you mentioned uh Bill Bill Brower, I think you said I saw him interviewed on TV and he talked about um yeah his experience in in uh, uh the book so uh it gets your your um, seal of approval then you said it's a good book oh, it's terrific it reads like a fiction thriller wow okay is there any particular um aspect of your writing david that um you consider to be uh a particular strength uh, that that stand out for you whether it be dialogue or or character development um, or setting moods, or what what would you say is your greatest strength as a writer? Uh, definitely dialogue and definitely voice. If if there's anything that would distinguish me from anybody else, it's the voice. And, mm-hmm. you know, with the humor and stuff, and you either like it or you don't, right? I mean, it's not, um, but it's that's that's different from other books for sure. So I would say voice and definitely dialogue, banter back and forth, that kind of thing. Yeah, great dialogue, great dialogue, funny dialogue. Um, yeah, definitely um, there. Now, let me ask you about the fact that I said at the top, Grover Gardner, read oh, yeah. your books. Uh, and I think he's just a terrific reader. It, he's got to be in demand. Uh, is How did you end up with Grover Gardner was he, because, you know, a lot of times they try to make the voice of the reader sound like the author's voice. Your voice and his voice are very distinct. They're very different. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Um, he, you know, the publisher got him for the first book. And then as they went on, they continued to, you know, get him. He became the voice of Andy. And he's, he's I, I believe it or not, I only heard his voice for the first time a couple of years ago. Uh, I guess I had some psychological reason for not wanting to hear what Andy sounded like, but um, people love him. I mean, mm-hmm. I get I get an amazing amount of emails about Grover Gardner, and he is um, he's a major player in that world. Like he reads the Robert Caro LBJ books. He read John Updike. I mean, he he really reads some serious stuff. And I'm like, he's like slumming it when he does the Andy Carpenter books, <laughs> but he loves to do them. So I've never met him. We we email to each other occasionally. But what happens is these books wind up one one of them won best book of the year in the what they call I think the Audis, which is the awards for um, audio books. And but they always yes. get nothing for best book. I mean they're they do great, and it's got to be Grover Gardner. I mean the books are no better in video in audio than they are in print, right? I mean it's the same writing. And they get all kinds of uh, praise because of him. He's he's apparently beloved by the people who read these books. Yeah, he he's he's great at what he does. He really is. You're lucky to have him. Um, so 
Fantastic. Um, just in wrapping up, David, uh, looking forward, uh, you're working on one book now, two books, three books. What, what are you working on right now? Uh, the the uh, There's a book coming out July, uh, actually in two weeks, July 4th, uh, called, uh, these titles are embarrassing, right? But it's called Flop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> and it's... Um, hey, they sell. Yeah, and, and as Andy Carpenter go, books go, it's one of the better ones for sure. I mean, I was very happy with it when I finished it. Um, and then there's an even more embarrassingly titled book coming out. I read a Christmas, Andy, every year, and they come out in October. And it's called Twas the Bite Before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and I just signed it. But and I've been writing three books a year. And, and now I signed a new contract. And next year, I'm going to write just two books. There'll be an Andy that comes out in May and another Andy in October. But they're not. I have no idea what they're even going to be about yet. I don't know what they're about until I start writing them. I mean, I, I don't plan the story in advance at all. So you just start, okay, you, you you have a starting point, you start to write, and then it develops and you figure out where you're where you're going with it. Yeah, I I, I, I don't think three pages ahead. I mean, I can't. It's exhausting. I, I just, I'm not able to do it. I wish I could, but I can't. So the, the story just goes where it goes. Yeah. Well, that's organic writing. There's a lot of people who absolutely cannot do that. You know, a lot of people who warn against it. I know I've written myself into a corner trying to do that before. And although I don't outline everything, because uh, I do want you know it to breathe and have a take on a life of its own. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's dangerous for a lot of writers. So um, again, I it's it that way if I could, if I was able to do otherwise, but what happened was one time, I had to, I, I'll be brief. I, I, I was writing, I was hired to write a mini series for NBC. And when you write a mini series in those days, you had to write what's called a Bible, which is like a 50 page outline listing everything that's going to be in the, that script. And I had to do it because NBC said I had to do it. So I did. And the script turned out to be awful. And one of the reasons it was awful in my view was because having that, outline took out all the spontaneity from the writing like i just I, I couldn't go where i felt i should go because i was stuck by the outline that i wrote and so it, but but in terms of the novels i just am unable to think ahead well it sounds like a more natural way to write it's working for you i really enjoy your books david and i appreciate you coming on on the program thank you great interview thank you very much